Ben lives in Barcelona and works as an English teacher, teacher trainer and materials writer. He's taught for over 20 years in the UK, Spain and Hong Kong and currently teaches materials writing on an online ESOL Masters at the New School New York. He's published the Teacher's Handbook, Language Learning with Digital Video, and is the co-author of, of Eyes Open, Uncover and English Unlimited. So over to you, Ben. Thank you very much, Laura. And uh, it's great to see so many people from so many different countries in this webinar. Um, just uh, checking it, first of all, that everyone can hear me OK. Please just type in the box if, if that's OK. Fatima says yes, that's good. Shahana, Alex says Thank you, Nicole. Okay, thank you, everybody. It <laughs> seems like you can hear me fine. Um, I mentioned that it's great to see that so many people from so many different countries, because this talk is all about global competency. It's all about getting our teenage learners um, globally competent. And if you're a bit confused about that, uh, what that means, um, the first few slides today will explain um, what global competency is and and what it entails and in this uh, webinar, what we're going to try and do is see how, once we've defined it and once we've analysed why it's important, what we're going to do is um, look at certain tasks that we can do with our teenage students to encourage uh, global competency. So first of all, um, what it is, and, and I think what we need to do is to look at the OECD. The, if you're not sure about that, um, who, who, what that organization is, it's the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And I don't know if some of you know that they run uh, a program uh, called PISA, which is a program for international student assessment. It's for designed for 15 year olds. It lays out guidelines and policy um, uh, issues for, for different age groups, including um, in the PISA uh, uh, assessment program, it is the 15 year olds. And um, it is possible that in 2018, uh, the PISA tests, that's the OECD's PISA test, will include a new, a new measurement of such global skills, uh, uh, global competency. So it's the EO OECD um, who have, let's say, um, established this, have given us this umbrella term for this competency. And essentially, it covers some areas that you might be familiar with. First of all, intercultural awareness. So you'll see there, there are three parts to this definition from the OECD. And in fact, on that slide, you probably can see a, um, a link. And that is a very important document that the OECD have put together uh, in relation to PISA. It's called Global Competency for an Inclusive World. And some of the information that you're going to see at the beginning of this talk, some of the, let's say, theoretical information comes from that document. It's the, it's the best place to go if you want a definition and more details of what global competency is. So essentially, according to the OECD, uh, global competency is this capacity to analyse global and intercultural issues critically and from multiple perspectives. So this is a kind of uh, um, what, looking at what we've I mean, it's essentially intercultural awareness, but the important word there is critically. And this comes in to the second one as well. And in a sense, it, I see it as a kind of combination of intercultural awareness and critical thinking. So this is the important thing. It's not just being conscious of the world around you, of this globalized world around you, but being able to look at issues uh, from a critical perspective and from multiple perspectives as well. Um, it is also the capacity, as it says here, to understand how differences, these globe, these differences, these cultural differences can affect perceptions, judgments and ideas of self and others. So in other words, it's not just being aware of these issues, but it's uh, it is bearing in mind the effect that these issues and these differences can have on people's uh, perceptions and awareness. And finally, and I think this is perhaps the most sort of idealistic part, but let's say a very important part of this competency, it is the capacity to engage in open, appropriate and effective interactions with others from uh, different backgrounds on the basis of a shared respect for human dignity. Now that sounds very, there's a big word. And in actual fact, thinking about it from the practical point of view, when designing tasks for teenage English learners, it is much easier to look at the first two bullet points there. 
but I will at the end of today's um, webinar show you an activity that I designed which I think does uh, engage in this open interaction with different, different uh, students from different backgrounds and does definitely promote a shared respect for human dignity. So in other words, that's, that third bullet point, let's say, brings it all together, but it is much more difficult, of course, to um, design tasks, practical tasks, with that aim in mind. Let's say that is the background aim, that is the aim, the general aim, but the first two uh, bullet points are the ones we'll be focusing on in this webinar. Okay, um, so just now we've defined global competency. I know it's a little bit complicated, that, that definition, but we will, I think, hopefully, you'll be able to understand it a little bit better when you look at the tasks. So first of all, we'll go into a little bit more detail now when we look at what does it mean to be globally competent in today's age. Then we're going to look at certain tasks. I'm going to show you a video as well that we um, have, that we recorded uh, with Cambridge that I think sums up a lot of these ideas. Then I'm going to show you um, how we've incorporated global competency into materials and I'll focus there on Eyes Open and Uncover, the teenage, the course for teenagers that uh, I have co-authored with Kerry Jones, published by Cambridge. And finally, uh, we'll look at some classroom tasks, just everyday tasks that you can do that are not related to any specific materials. And as I said, we'll finish with this idea of valuing humanity and cultural diversity as an overall aim um, for many of the tasks and activities we're going to look at today. So first of all, what does it mean to be global, globally competent? I think there are three, just to try and understand this a little bit better, um, there are three key ideas, three key concepts that we can um, that are, are inside the PISA document, which will help us to uncover uh, global competency. And, and the PISA document divides global competency into three key areas. First of all, skills. What are the skills that you're going to need to be globally competent? Then the knowledge and understanding that would be required. And then finally, the attitudes, which perhaps is the most difficult thing to, uh, let's say, imbue our learners with. So let's look at the skills first of all. Well, basic, well before we look at that, that's a, I hope you can see that on your screens okay. Um, but that's, let's say, a, the paradigm behind uh, the, um, the idea of global competency. And as you'll see there, that are many of these things are areas, that's what I'm saying, that global competency is a kind of umbrella term, because many of these topics are, are topics that, or issues that you may have seen uh, before, critical thinking, intercultural awareness, and so on. And that's the part of skills and knowledge and understanding. As I said at the beginning, it's the attitude section, um, which perhaps is um, the area which we haven't uh, been able, not that, well, we haven't seen so many talks and papers on this subject with, in relation to English language teaching. But the three together, skills, knowledge, understanding, and attitudes, all combine uh, to, these three components combine to contribute to valuing human dignity and cultural diversity. So let's look at these three areas. Let's look at the yellow one first, um, the, the green one first, knowledge and understanding. So knowledge and understanding of global issues and intercultural knowledge and understandings. As I said, this may be familiar to some of you already. Um, what do you understand by intercultural understanding? First of all, if you'd like to put that in the chat box, intercultural understanding, intercultural knowledge and understanding, what, how would you define that? Let's so that uh, I think most, a, lot of, a lot of people will know about this already, but it's worth refreshing our, our minds. I see lots of people are, are typing at the same time, but let's see. <laughs> yes, between cultures. Marcin, that's, that's good. Having respect for and knowledge about other cultures, absolutely. Familiarity with, wow, a lot of things are coming in now. Open-mindedness. In Empathy, great. That's uh, from Anastasia. I think one of the things, a lot of you are getting the key points there, but I think one of the, are creating a third space, that's interesting, Peter. I think one of the, the very key areas that many people forget with intercultural awareness is that it's not just it's not just 
learning and appreciating and having respect for other cultures. It is seeing the connections between those cultures and your own culture. So it is the reflection. This is the key word in intercultural awareness. When we're looking at these issues of knowledge and understanding, it is sharing. Yes, right. Sharing cultures, as Gillian has said, uh, being open to our differences and well as similarities. So it's that reflection on your own culture that is absolutely intrinsic to intercultural awareness. Thank you for all those all those contributions. So let's have a look at what the OECD, what the PEAS document says. And it says that um, knowledge and understanding of global issues implies familiarity with very important uh, um, issues which cut across national boundaries. So things like climate change, migration, poverty, and, and so on. This is, these are key. And you'll find that many, very often, these issues are introduced into our course books, into our course materials, aren't they? Secondly, uh, the capacity to understand the interrelationships between these issues, trends, and systems across the globe. So again, it's looking beyond your own context, or rather it, it's looking at your own context and looking at similarities between your, um, your context and global context. I've just, read, I've just been reading a fascinating book called The Sixth Extinction. I'll just write it down here. Uh, it's all about climate change. And um, I, I found this fascinating because um, it's all about um, how uh, man, you know, is, is, is unfortunately um, destroying many of the species uh, in the world. And one of the conclusions of the book um, is it says that it gives lots of case studies of how certain species are disappearing around the world. And then it says, and I think this is a very powerful uh, statement, it says at the end, um, just look around, you might think that all these changes and all these differences, um, all, these, all these changes to the world species are, are just unique to these places in the world. Uh, and in actual fact, it said, look, it said, the conclusion of the book, it says, look uh, in your local context, and um, look carefully, and I'm sure you'll find an example that is right around the corner from you. And I think that is what intercultural awareness of global issues is all about. It's all about seeing these global trends and tendencies and issues and seeing how they impact on your local context. And in my case, uh, living here in Barcelona, um, it, it is, uh, I can see it clearly impacting on the pine trees where I live, uh, I live in a Mediterranean, in a beautiful Mediterranean climate, but unfortunately many of the pines are, are suffering um, because of unusual, unusually dry summers. Just think about where you live and, um, and think about how that, those changes may be impacting on your local um, uh, context. So that's um, knowledge and understanding of global issues and how they have how they can cut across these boundaries and have effect on many different people in many different contexts. And then intercultural understanding. And this is exactly what you were uh, brainstorming about. Um, our Nicola said racing extinction is a documentary. OK, so there's some lovely um, so a lot of people have also uh, referring to other other uh, related topics there. Um, and I can see some other people talking about trees and so on in, in their context. So that's, again, they're not very happy news, I admit, but these are very important issues, of course, that we need to share with our learners. So intercultural knowledge understanding is exactly what I was talking about. This is the definition from the PISA document. It involves knowledge about one's own culture, other cultures, and the similarity and differences between cultures. I think many of you, um, I think Gillian and among others, um, did actually come up with that definition be, um, uh, between you. So well done for that. Let's look at then the, the yellow one, which is uh, skills. And they talk about analytical and critical thinking and the ability to interact respectfully, appropriately and effectively. And it's talking about empathy and flexibility here. Um, and applying critical thinking to a global or intercultural problem is not an easy task. It's difficult. It's very important, critical thinking but it's very difficult to define sometimes. And um, here are some bullet points that I think we're gonna do a task in a moment that will, I hope, uh, exemplify some of these points. Um, but one of the very important um, tenet central ideas of cultural th uh, critical thinking is recognizing that your assumptions may influence the evaluation. So it's the assumptions you have uh, things that you take for granted that you don't question, these can very much influence the way you 
think about things, where you evaluate things critically. So these assumptions are very important. I'll show you an example very soon, don't worry. Um, and this is another key point that we need to instill our learners with, um, acknowledging that your beliefs and judgments are often dependent on your own cultural perspective. So this is, again, quite a lot of um, bullet points here. I'm sorry if it's a little bit too much um, to take in all at the same time, but this will be recorded and you'll be able to look at these bullet points. And you'll also, as I said, if you've taken note of that link, you'll be able to uh, look at this document more carefully at your leisure. But I think it's this key issue of um, the assumptions that we have and how they influence our evaluation and the beliefs that we have, um, understanding that these come um, culturally, these come to us um, culturally. Okay, so let me just, before we um, look now at some specific tasks, I want to show you a video um, that I think sums up some of the points um, behind what global competency is. And the reason that I like this video is that it's a vox pop, it's an interview with a student. And um, it kind of speaks for itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play you the video now, and then I'd like you to write in the comment box any connections that you find between what this uh, student has to say and the topic of global competency. So I hope you enjoy the video. Travel to a place called Neuchâtel, uh, where there's a magnificent lake, which is very beautiful and where people generally go on the weekends to have a walk with their families. There was one family that looked uh, very nice. It was, there was, the father was a Swiss man uh, of European origin and he was wearing something that seemed quite unusual at the time. That was basically an Afghan robe, so very, a very loose-fitting robe with uh, pointy shoes, and he was wearing a turban as well. And his wife was Japanese, of Japanese origin, and they had two little kids, uh, half Swiss, half Japanese. Uh, and after some time, the men addressed me in English, which was a bit unusual because French is the language that they would usually have used. But I spoke to him for a bit, and then when I discovered he was Swiss, we switched to French. And he introduced me to his wife, who, uh, for whom English and French were second languages as well. Um, that already felt very unusual because uh, it was just like a complete mix of culture. And uh, for me, that family demonstrated an acceptance of different cultures and they had actually incorporated different cultures into their lifestyle. And um, while I was chatting with them, I discovered that the man had traveled a lot and he'd actually been to India and Afghanistan and he spoke, uh, he knew a bit of Urdu or Hindi, which sound the same. So as I speak Hindi as well, we chatted a bit in Hindi as well. So in the course of that conversation, we spoke in English, French and Hindi and that was a very beautiful experience. Okay, I hope you could see that video. Um, it's actually just a two minute video from the course, one of the Cambridge courses, English Unlimited, which I was involved in, in writing a, a few years ago. But I think the reason I chose it um, is uh, that uh, I think it sums up a lot of the points that we've mentioned about global competency. So could you just write uh, down, uh, she's, I think she says it quite clearly at the end there. By the way, she's from Malaysia um, and she's in Switzerland. You may, have, you may not have very heard the very beginning where she talks about she's in, I think somebody is from Switzerland in this webinar, in fact. <laughs> I'm um, losing a bit of track at the moment, but uh, I think she talks about she, she meets this family in Neuchâtel in Switzerland. Um, now, if you just, uh, oh, Neuchâtel, that's Nicole, uh, Nicole there. Uh, and uh, could you just write down why you, what's the connection between that video and global competency and, and, and what, what does it say? So let's give you a couple of minutes to do that.
Okay, so we're getting some interesting opinions already. Isabella, the ability to connect your culture to others, exactly intercultural awareness, reflecting on your culture and similarities and differences. Um, absolutely fantastic. <laughs> We've got a lot of different opinions here. There's a lot of you. Um, Gillian, we need to understand people and cultures from around the globe because, of, because people are global today. Exactly. Um, this is about the world we're living, being multicultural and pluriculture, Martine. Um, and I think what the key, key connection I see is what the, the lady says. She says that this family had incorporated different cultures into their lifestyles. So in other words, they're a global family anyway. They come from different cultures. There's Japanese, there's French, there's Hindi, there's English. But rather than uh, choose one of these cultures, they incorporate all of them in this kind of melting pot of cultures. And she is constant. She's amazed by this encounter with these people in Switzerland because she suddenly found all these different connections with them. Uh, and I think this, you might think that this is a, a unique kind of experience, but I think actually it is um, an increasingly common one in this globalized world that we, we, um, and I'm sure that you may have had similar experiences to this woman here. Um, at some point in perhaps not four different languages that you've been speaking at the same time or three or four different cultures. But I think it is increasingly common uh, uh, in this kind of melting pot in which we live uh, uh, now. Uh, there are an increasing number of people and maybe your students themselves who do not necessarily have one culture. They may have a mother from one culture, one nationality and language, a father from another, and they may live in a third culture. And um, this kind of um, hybrid, cultural hybrid, is, is a, obviously a consequence of, of the globalized world we live in. So um, it's great to see so many of your opinions coming through here in the chat box. And I'd love to um, kind of read all of them at the speed they're coming through, but it's uh, fascinating that you've, that you've re responded so positively uh, to that video and can see the connections there. As I said, I think it's all really about incorporating these different cultures and having respect for the for these cultural values uh, rather than uh, having a monocultural uh, perspective. Okay, so let's look at some other tasks now which foster global competency. Now the world is full of images and here are three strong images that you may uh, recognize. Um, I wonder if you have seen these images before. I kind of created this kind of collage um, but these, as you can see, these images, these iconic images have a lot in common and they all are from different parts of the world, but they all reflect a, a unfortunate uh, global trend. Some of you are recognizing some of them. Uh, that's right. The, th the third one is from Gezi Park in Istanbul. Um, I'll tell you it actually because uh, you, you, uh, you may have seen these before, but it's not easy to remember where they're from. The first one is actually Louisiana and Baton Rouge. Uh, in uh, a protest that, about um, all the, the race, problems of uh, racial conflict there are in some of the southern states of the United States. And the second one is in Sweden in a, a right-wing extremist march that was taking place and the, the woman protesting there. And the third one in, um, in Istanbul, in actual fact. These images are, are very important. These images have become iconic, but sometimes these images are too strong in my opinion. And um, sometimes when we talk about uh, global competency, many people talk about, you know, showing images like this to represent, uh, you know, issues which are common in different, uh, uh, in different cultures, or let's say not necessarily issues, but the, the same kinds of protests that can take place in different cultures for different reasons. But I often think that images like this, although they're very powerful, they may, in actual fact, they may, may be too impactful. And, and sometimes, um, because an image has been seen so many times, it can lose its impact. So although these images do sum up many global issues of, very, of great importance, I'm going to show you another image, which is not so iconic, which is not so famous. And, I, and I'd like to design, I've designed an activity for you around this image. The reason I've chosen it is because it is less well known than these images. So another thing that's important when you're designing tasks for students is to choose images perhaps which are less well known. So um, I'm going to show you, this is the image that we're going to work with. Um, and I want you to look at this image and I'm going to um, ask you some questions about it. And this 
These questions are, let's say, my attempt to, uh, to show how we can foster global competency in the classroom. So these are the questions, and, and they, remember they are touching on central ideas of critical thinking as well. So these, the idea of this activity is that we will be questioning assumptions, um, that we'll be thinking through the consequences of the way, the way we reason, or the, the line of reasoning. We'll be looking for evidence, and uh, we'll be considering alternative ideas. So let's, um, I'm going to go back to that image again. Have a look at the image carefully. What can you see there? Okay, just, um, I use images obviously because it is, uh, you know, extremely, a very economic way, uh, economical way of, um, you know, transmitting an idea rather than uh, reading a text. So in a webinar like this, it's much easier to use the power of an image to reflect an idea than to get you to, order to read a text. So here's the image and here are some questions. Where is the place? How do you know? Some of you already guessed the place. <laughs> uh, so that was very, very fast. But there are 140 of you, so I guess some of you. But yeah, where is the place? How do you know? What are the people doing? Okay, so those are basic questions, aren't they? Those are questions that you may have asked students before about an image. And the answers to those questions will, well, the students will come up with them because of prior knowledge uh, and because of evidence and I can see some of you have already said that they think it is in the border of America and Mexico and the evidence for that is well I can so see some people saying uh, let me have a look They're playing volleyball or, or, or something which could be a yellow school bus Nicola said and so that was very very fast um, have a look at the net does it look like a normal net? Neil has said, sorry, Ivan has said because of the beer brand. So Ivan has spotted that. I'm going to show you that photo again. He spotted that Tecate. So on there, you can see at the center of the image is a, a brand of beer from, from Mexico. I don't know if anybody is from Mexico or the United States in this uh, webinar. I know we saw someone from Ecuador before, but I don't know if anyone else, a few Latin Americans from Brazil, but I don't know if any Mexicans uh, are uh, in in the webinar, it might be a bit early in the morning for them, <laughs> uh, and that's one of Nicole has already said. This is one of the reasons uh, that I chose this image for today, because as you know, our Ivan said he lives in Mexico. Okay, um, and uh, obviously today is the U.S. Uh, presidential election, and uh, that's of course um, the whole issue of the border between Mexico and the United States has been such an important part of the campaign and. Uh, some people have mentioned Trump's, when Nicole has mentioned uh, Trump's wall and so on. So that's one of the reasons why I chose this. You've, some of you have been very, very fast in identifying uh, the place. I'm sure a lot of you had no idea where this border was, had absolutely no idea. In order for you to know, you have to be, a, you have, it's not a question of being uh, more intelligent, is it? It's simply a question of having contact, some prior knowledge of, um, well, the landscape, um, the yellow bus, uh, the, 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 the certain clues that we saw, Tecate, uh, maybe some of you have even seen images like this before. Um, but the question, what's important about what we're trying to do here is that not really, uh, it's, it, it, what's in, it's not important to guess the place, that's not important. The important thing is to look for evidence, and some of you have, uh, have, uh, have been writing in the, top, the uh, chat box, um, and then to look at the next two questions, because it's the next two questions which are really important. What are the people doing? What is surprising about this? So what are the people doing? They are playing sport, yeah, they're, they're playing volleyball. And why is that surprising? So why is that surprising? Maybe somebody could write down that in the chat box. Okay, they're playing volleyball, which is a team game. Yeah. So what is surprising and why is this image interesting for, for me and the relationship with global competency, do you think? The net is the border, that's right. The border divides, but the game unites. Okay, that's nice. That's from Peter. Um, 
they are in a different countries playing a game together. Okay. So it's a surprisingly positive. We just saw some very negative images, didn't we? Well, positive images, but of negative facts. We saw those female protests, uh, which were obviously came about because of oppression. This is a very positive image. Here we are seeing uh, a border. We are seeing two different teams, one on one country and one on the other. And this is not something that we normally see. So this is where the global competency comes in. It says, what is surprising? It's surprising that they are playing together and they seem to be playing happily together. And then the next question is the really important one. How does this compare with other images of such places? So we see that, uh, yes, the stereotype is radically undone. Exactly. Ath Athanasios Dimakis. That's exactly the point that this image, what it does is it breaks with the stereotype. The stereotype we have of this border is that we see very negative images of it. But in actual fact here, the reason that this image is powerful is because we're seeing a powerfully positive image. And that kind of unity is not something you normally see in the border. So can you see that looking at that photo now again, um, by asking these kinds of questions, we're getting to the stage where students can analyze. Uh, rather than just describe, they are interpreting and they are analyzing the, Im the image from, let's say, this point of view of global competency. Um, so if you'd like to know a bit more about this image, then you can do some research, but I'm going to help you. This is exactly what it is. It's the US-Mexico border in uh, Arizona and in Sonora, Arizona in the United States and uh, Sonora in Mexico. The interesting thing is that the two towns have the same name, Naco, Naco, Arizona, Naco, Sonora. It'd be interesting to see which of the two candidates wins Arizona. It's one of the swing states tonight. And, um, this has been a huge issue in the uh, campaign uh, for the presidential election. Uh, and uh, it's been interesting thing about it is that this fiesta this celebration has been going on for many, many, many years. Um, when we look at an image, what's interesting is that we can look at it from three points of view. We can look at it from the affective point of view. We can look at it from the compositional point of view, and we can look at it from the critical point of view. In other words, the affective basically means is how does it make you feel? Uh, the composition is looking at all the details. For example, the yellow bus, the fact that the, the border is actually the net, uh, all the different clues that you've seen inside the composition. And the critical is the perspective that you draw uh, as a result of looking effectively and compositionally. In other words, you can't go to the critical first. The first is your effective response. Then you look at the composition and then you come up with a critical uh, perception of what you have seen. I think that's a very interesting uh, paradigm for analyzing images. Um, so this is one image of the border, but it's very different to other images of the border that we normally see. This is an image that is much more common. If you go to uh, photo libraries online and you put US Mexican border, you're not going to see an image like this one. You're more likely going to see an image like that one, which, and what does that image say? That image transmits, well, the, the incredible barrier, the physical barrier that exists between these two countries. Or you may see something like this in Wikipedia that uh, basically what it does is establishes this enormous difference. It establishes the extent of the border and the differences between the two countries. These are quite negative images. And here are other borders, other images of borders. So this is an area, it seems to me, this is the Hungarian border. And these are immigrants. Um, you may recognize this image from the summer when the newspapers when, when the Hungarians closed their border uh, for some time. And so we see a lots and lots of images of lots of different borders. Some are very negative and some are very positive. This image is uh, a, a wonderfully positive image of a border. This, anyone know where this is? This bridge connects two countries. So it's very different from the other images that we've just seen. That's right, Denmark and Sweden. And 
uh, that if you, what you can do, uh, this goes from Copenhagen to Malmo, from Denmark, or, and vice versa, uh, and what you can do with students is you can get them to look at different images of different borders, looking at positive images and negative images, looking at the world through these borders. So this is a way of encouraging global competency by taking a particular image and then seeing how this is represented, how this fact, this fact of uh, borders between countries and cultures is um, obviously different from one part of the world to another. Now, talking about other images, another area which is, um, let's say we can talk about, borders is one of them, and I chose that one because of today. Another area is, is, is graffiti, and uh, someone's already recognized this is a very famous graffiti by Banksy. You might find a, a, a piece of graffiti on a wall <laughs> or on a border. In fact, I'm, I think he has done that, hasn't he? Uh, in fact, um, um, he's uh, painted graffiti on walls, because of, on border walls, because uh, they are so um, symbolic. Um, but um, the interesting thing is how uh, graffiti, of course, is a, is a classic topic, but how we can introduce, begin to introduce this topic into the classroom. So um, here, for example, is one um, piece of graffiti, One Nation Under CCTV. I wonder if anyone realizes if you're from, some people are calling, uh, are in Britain, but Britain is, I think, the number one country in the world or so. It has more CCTV, more surveillance, closed circuit TV cameras in the world than any other country per population. Um, so uh, that's what that graffiti is saying next to that uh, camera on the right hand side. And there are lots, and lots of different types of graffiti around the world. So another issue, another um, sorry, another project you could do related with global competency is to get students to show different images of different graffiti. Graffiti like this, which is uh, or like this, which is let's say has to be analysed, much more abstract. Uh, graffiti like this, which is a message, a clear, uh, in this case, political message, and this, which is. Um, much, much more um, pictorial, much more like a mural, and say to students, okay, what does each of these images, what's the message it transmits? And you can use that paradigm I showed you before, affective, compositional, and critical. How does it make you feel, this graffiti? Look at the composition. Um, this graffiti takes up a whole building. It's not on a wall. It's the whole wall of, uh, not the border wall. It's the whole wall of a different a building. Um, and then the critical perspective. Uh, how does that change depending on the graffiti that you're looking at? And then get students to discuss the issue of um, graffiti and uh, street art. So um, what we're doing then is looking at different examples, and, and I'm going to show you these two, what we've, just to sum up, we've looked at the three central ideas of global competency, knowledge and understanding of global issues. So something really like a big, big issue of contemporary relevance, like the US-Mexican border, or it could be something much more local, like graffiti or street art, depends on your perspective. Then, uh, um, Intercultural knowledge and understanding, a reflection on different world borders, including own country's borders. And then analytical and critical thinking, comparison of different images of US-Mexican border and context where these images may be found. So can you see how that activity, looking at borders, has covered three of these central ideas of global competency? And the same with street art. So um, you could look at something more every day. Um, so this is something that students could easily go out and take pictures of. They can go out into their own cities and take pictures of street art. So knowledge and understanding of global issue could be rise of street art and its implications. Intercultural knowledge and understanding, it could be a comparison of graffiti and street art in students' own culture, and they could do a research project into other examples. And then analytical and critical thinking, would be, okay, street art and its messages, which are the most effective, impactful, why, how else could they, these messages be communicated? So can you see these two different examples um, are very different, but very similar. One is taking a big global topic, uh, which has political relevance at the moment, 
uh, and one is much more everyday, something which students could perhaps more easily um, introduce elements from their own culture. So this one, I think, uh, could be uh, something that we can easily put into our course materials. Um, and this is exactly what we're looking at here, how we can incorporate this into materials. Um, we can have a look here, for example, this this from Uncover uh, and um, Eyes Open is an example, art around us, uh, and it says match the word, this is for teens, match the words in the box with art around, which words describe where we see paintings and so on, and then we look at an example of uh, graffiti. Look at the photos and discuss uh, these questions. What is graffiti? Are all the photos examples of graffiti? If not, what are they? And these are questions that engaging um, uh, intercultural awareness and critical thinking. And as an extension of this, I would then get students to go out into their context and take photographs of graffiti. It might be on a wall, it might be on a train, it might be new, it might be old, and discuss well, what is this graffiti communicating? Is it art or is it vandalism? And so on. Other examples from Uncover and Eyes Open, and Laura has put in the chat box um, some information about Eyes Open there. If you want to know a little bit more information about the course book, we feature, you may have seen Kerry, my colleague, talking about this um, in her webinar about um, uh, global, uh, the global perspective, global and local. And um, we are very interested in this whole idea of cultural hybrid. So um, this is an example, it's called Chino meets Latino. It's all about LA and um, fusion food, where you can find uh, tacos, uh, Mexican food, which has a Chinese twist. And again, um, students can look at that text, can read that text, which is a kind of new kind of global phenomenon, and see if there are examples in their culture where there is a kind of fusion of the local culture with another culture. Or, or, and these are lots of different, there's so many different examples that I can't fit many into one hour um, a webinar, but you can see that these topics are, can be very, very close to um, students' uh, own local context. So this is what, this, uh, the, uh, what the students have to do is then create their own uh, fusion food. So she says, my fusion food is curry sushi, uh, for example. And another example from, um, sorry, another example from uh, eyes open is uh, Zaza Bazaar. Is a, is a, um, if you're interested in Britain, um, you'll be able to see, uh, you go to this website and in Eyes Open we cover, we, we focus on Zaza Bazaar, which is a, a huge, um, like a kind of shopping mall of, uh, it's like the, one of the biggest restaurants in the world, it incorporates food from all different countries in the world. Um, so you can choose from, you know, Vietnamese, Japanese, Chinese, Indian, Mexican, um, Italian, all in one uh, one place. A huge, yeah, a kind of food court, but on a massive scale. Okay, so returning to our three things, we're going to just, um, I'm, I'm going to run out of time as always, but I want to have at least 10 minutes for you to ask questions. Um, but can you see how those different um, tasks, or um, you could be talking about food, it could be talking about graffiti, it could be talking about borders, are all sort of touching on these key issues. Um, but one of the things that are, is very important behind this is, as I said, the, 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 the values that kind of underlie uh, these skills, knowledge, understanding, and attitude. And at the very end of this webinar, I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to kind of um, uncover that, wh why these values are so important. Just very quickly, before we look at that, um, um, five, the last five minutes, uh, let's just have a look at a few classroom tasks that you can um, um, do with your students. These are very quick ideas related with global competency. This is an activity called the English Around Me. And this, this is all about how English has become the global language. So what we do with this activity is simply get students to go out into their um, cities and, and uh, their local context and take photographs of English and also not just take photos of English, but say why is English being used and to what effect? And what is the consequence of this? So these are some photos I've taken in Barcelona. Here's a lots of different, different examples of English being used in Barcelona. 
Okay. Um, Barcelona is a very, very, very cosmopolitan city, lots of tourists. And a lot of people are saying that English is invading and that this is having a negative effect on local culture. So this could be your intercultural and awareness and critical thinking. Is English is obviously a global language, very important to learn, but is it having, uh, uh, for Barcelona local people, is it having a negative effect on uh, the way they see their city? That's called the English around me. This is another one, it's called cultural misconceptions. And this is all about reflecting on your own identity and your own uh, cultural identity. And students just use this, uh, these template to come up with sentences about their culture. It's all about really how students see, look, trying to get students to see their culture from another person's point of view, from an outsider's point of view. Um, so um, another task I've written recently is all about trying to get students to imagine uh, the first impressions that people might have of their culture. That's another idea. Uh, and that's a very important task to be able to step back and look at your culture from an outsider's point of view. So this encourages students to think about stereotypes, to accept and to reject the ones which they feel um, are, to accept the ones they feel are true and to reject the ones which they feel are not true. Uh, another one is called My Culture Collage, and that's looking at different images. It's a nice idea to get students, teenagers like this very much, to get images to reflect their cultural identity. So um, this is one of my students, and uh, you can see some Catalan there. And I like the way that he used these, he, he did this as a task, and he used a different, three different languages. He used English, Spanish, and Catalan there to reflect in the, in the captions, to reflect his identity. And I asked him, why did he write guitar um, why did he write son? And he said to me that was because his father played the guitar and Spanish guitar and he is following his father's footsteps and so on. Um, why is peth? Peth means fish and he loves swimming. So it's common peth. He's like a fish. Fiestero. Uh, is that wrong? Fiestero maybe, Isabel. I'm not sure. But anyway, a party person in, um, in um, Barcelona is very common to have the fiestas are uh, with fire, lots of fire. Okay, um, so that's a nice example, using photographs and captions. And another student from Sao Paulo, we had a couple of people from Brazil. Um, this was an activity, again, the same activity, but just with uh, images. So um, one of the students said to me, oh, Sao Paulo has a very bad reputation, but has some very beautiful things. Notice the graffiti there. <laughs> Uh, and I love her collage of, uh, of uh, her photo collage of Sao Paulo because, again, it's very personal to her, um, but it, it does show some key things about the city, the football team, the Havaianas um, uh, footwear. Uh, I can't go through all the different details, the jacaranda trees. And again, this would be very different to a postcard that you might find of Sao Paulo, for example. So it's all about getting students to come up with their own images of their city. What are the images that really represent their city for them? And explain why. As if they were kind of selling their city to an, someone who had never, did know nothing about, um, uh, about the Sao Paulo, for example. And the last one, um, the last slide then, is all about valuing human dignity and culture. That was the point that I said it was very difficult to, to design a task. In a way, all of these tasks, what they're trying to do is to get us to value human dignity, have a respect for human, different humans from different um, walks of life and cultures, and celebrate diversity, not feel threatened by diversity. Uh, it's not easy to design tasks which do that, but um, one of the things that I designed for English Unlimited was this, and this was a task I designed for adult learners, it's not for teenagers, but it could be easily, one of the things that's nice about it is that it took, it looks at different teenagers. So though this was a book for adult learners, what's nice is that it's teenagers and young, yeah, in fact, younger than teenagers, it's different children who live in London, um, who all live in London, but that were born in different countries, born everywhere, uh, raised in Britain. So they're born in different countries, but they all live in London. And I found this photo, um, I found this article, it's a kind of example of photojournalism, 
in the Guardian newspaper, and they gave us permission to use it. It's wonderful, wonderful material, um, because these teenagers and other, from 11 to 19 years old, I think, um, are really sort of talking about how they integrate with life in London, the things that they love and the things they miss from their own culture. And the central idea here is, is that we value these different people's opinions. We value their, that we don't censor them, that we value their opinions, we value their diversity and their different cultural values. And, and I was so pleased when uh, we got permission to use this because going back to what we saw, the interview with the lady from Malaysia, this is an increasingly common thing that, that, that students now come from so, that, you know, so, so many people live in so many different countries in this globalized world. It's called Born Everywhere, Raised in Britain. And uh, you, if you Google that, you will find uh, the original photo journalism project. And here is one quotation that's from The Guardian. And this is one quotation I particularly like from a, a teenager in Madagascar. He says, I miss the freedom that the children have because they can just play outside and the parents don't really worry that much. Whereas here, there's a lot of worrying going on. It's beautifully eloquent the way these teenagers talk about their lives. So if you're interested in that, um, it's very, very, I'm not saying use that material particularly. You could go because it's designed for adults, but you could go to The Guardian, you could find that born everywhere, raised in Britain, and you could use some of those teenagers' words uh, to talk about this whole issue of global competency. And finally, a final quotation, and I think this is what it's all about, really, uh, what cult global competency is about. He's, this is Moran in his book on intercultural awareness. He says, every learner, a little bit like that, that teenager from Madagascar, every learner has a distinct story to tell and teaching culture is about constructing and hearing these stories. Uh, our Paola, very, it's very kind, of, has put down, has put that link there for that uh, Guardian article. Some lovely text you'll find in that article about teenagers. And that's exactly what Moran is saying here, that culture, understanding culture, understanding global diversity is about hearing these different stories and um, having uh, respect for them. Okay, so um, that is uh, that is the webinar finished. I hope you've enjoyed it. Any questions? If you want to have some inf uh, get information about me and my work and eyes open and uncover, you can go to uh, bengoldstein.es, and that's uh, a picture of my dog there. But now we uh, we have ten minutes or eight minutes for questions. Brilliant. Thank you, Ben. So that's brilliant. So, yes, over to you, everybody. Do you have any questions? Please type them in the chat box. They seem to be interested in my dog at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got one here from Ivan. Um, is developing Ivan. intercultural awareness the same as being cosmopolitan? No, no, not at all. Um, I think... Uh, the, 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 thing, the key thing about intercultural awareness is the reflection on your own culture. I think that's the important point. Cosmopolitan is, is simply um, uh, being worldly, you know, and knowing about the world, um, having contact with people, being in contact with people from different cultures and appreciating uh, these cultures. But um, intercultural awareness is all about, as I said, that reflection on your own culture. You can be a very cosmopolitan person and travel around the world and know lots of people, but you may not be able to make those connections, uh, appreciate those differences and similarities between your culture and other cultures. And I think it's that which is the, the key difference. Okay. Yes, yeah, so much more sense. I think Ivan is saying so intercultural awareness is more sensitive. Yes, much more. Well, more sensitive and, and more analytical. And so more um, reflective. Nicole asks then, how do you sh actually make your students show that they've become more interculturally aware or competent? Well, I think that's a good question. I think um, that can be done through these projects. So I think that project, for example, I didn't really, I really did rush through the last few activities, but for example, that, that little project of your collage, yeah, making a collage of your city or your neighborhood or whatever, um, by thinking about how your 
country, the stereotypes um, that are associated with your with your country or your city, uh, and then accepting and rejecting these stereotypes and creating your own representative image of your where you live. That is evidence that you have thought about. You've thought through these different things. You thought about this. You thought about the assumptions people have. You thought about those stereotypes. You've accepted some. You've rejected others. Whatever. And and then you produce your own uh, piece of work which explains that. But it's a very good question because the important thing is not just to produce the collage, to produce the work, but then in class to explain that to others. And that's something we often forget in this digital age, that it's not good enough just to, okay, I've done my, you know, image collage. Uh, it's very, very nice. Don't you think it's interesting? No. Get them to explain why they chose those images. What are they? What message are they trying to transmit with those images? That's very, very important behind all of these tasks. It's not good enough for them just to produce the poster or produce the collage or whatever, or go and take photographs of graffiti or whatever. They need to be able to show in class uh, or to you uh, through a project, a written or a spoken project, what the implications are of this. And I think that's very, very important. And um, Kate asks, do you ever find that these topics and issues cause sensitivity in the classroom? Yes, that's a good, that's a very good question. I mean, that's another reason, uh, perhaps, why not to show very strong images sometimes, very uh, very iconic images. I've often seen that teachers use them, even with teenage learners, and it can be they can be too strong. As I said, they can be too impactful. They can touch on issues that people prefer not to talk about. I think you this is something that you can only really judge with your the group of learners you have, the rapport that you have, the confidence they have. Uh, amongst them, the kind of what we call the small culture of the classroom, you know, um, this is something that, 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 that an experienced teacher should be able to kind of pick up on how far you can go. But I think the important thing is not to, I totally appreciate that, and I think you must be conscious of that. But at the same time, uh, in my work, I've always tried to push things a little bit <laughs> because I think that very often uh, we do. Um, you know, it is very, we play it very safe and often learners are talking about things which don't have any meaning for them or don't matter to them. And um, obviously with teenage learners, well, the thing you really have to avoid is anything to do with self-image, you know, which they are extremely sensitive about and competition. And all of these issues, uh, you know, we have to be very careful of. But, you know, talking about issues that are important to them um, should come out if you design the tasks um, carefully enough. So as I said, that cultural collage activity or whatever, that all comes from the learners. The learners will produce that and you're not in control of that. So you just set the activity up and then you see what they come up with. Uh, and then therefore, you know, you, you're kind of in, you're in a safer territory because it's the learners who have come up with, with that um, input, if you see what I mean. But yeah, I do appreciate that question. That's very important. And we have touched on a few areas today which are, which could be a little bit taboo. So, you know, I think that's always worth bearing in mind, especially with teens. Brilliant. Thanks. And just one, one time for one last question, I think. Um, yeah. Anthanasios asks, do you think that the globalised classroom, perhaps um, unwittingly, fosters an Anglo-centric worldview? So he's asking if the, you think there's space for other languages. Absolutely, that's a very good question. Absolutely, I think absolutely is there a space for other languages, and, and although we're English teachers, uh, we have to we have to promote that, and that is part of intercultural awareness and critical thinking, isn't it? And in fact, um, um, that question is extremely related to that um, activity that I showed called uh, the English Around You, where, where I said these are all photographs of English taken in Barcelona where I live and in actual fact, yes, it's great that the, all that English is there for the English language speakers who can come to Barcelona and feel at home. But, uh, you know, um, that is presenting an Anglo-centric Anglo worldview, isn't it? And in fact, uh, a lot of Catalan and Spanish speakers feel threatened by that. And that's something that could definitely come up in, in, in class. Uh, you don't necessarily need to address that directly, but those kinds of questions will come up Again, if you set those kinds of tasks, 
Um, but yes, it's a very good it's a very good question, and we have to be very aware of that. Luckily, we have also um, evidence that that the the world is more plurilingual, as we saw with that lovely video um, from English Unlimited. That you know that, 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 that happily English can sit beside other languages, uh, and there she was, that that lady from Malaysia, you know, explaining in English how she communicated in three different other languages. In, 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 in Switzerland. So, you know, I think, um, yes, there is a danger, but I think uh, obviously English can uh, sit beside other languages as well, uh, very happily, as we saw in, in that example. Thank you. Well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. Um, so thanks very much to Ben. Um, don't forget to check our events page for details of our upcoming webinars, which you can visit at cambridge.org slash ELT events. And the recording of today's webinar should be live on our blog and YouTube channel next week. And please don't forget to download your certificate from the link on screen. So that's all from us in Cambridge. And thanks very much again to Ben. That was a fascinating webinar. Um, look forward Thank to you, Laura. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And again, lovely to see so many different people from so many different countries. It couldn't have been more uh, important for the topic of today's webinar. So uh, I really appreciate that. Thank you for connecting from so many different places in the world. Thanks, everybody. See you Hope again. You Have a great it. rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.